Hi, this is Zach Fulkerson with the Critical Care Curriculum. This is the third lecture in respiratory failure, and we are going to be discussing Acute Respiratory Distress Syndrome, or ARDS. Um, ARDS is basically what happens um, that causes lungs to look like this when someone presents to, in the course of hours or even days or even hours to look like this. Notice this person has bilateral infiltrates on their lungs. We've also had to step up the level of care for this patient. They have an endotracheal tube to provide oxygen to them. And so it can happen relatively quickly, again, in days or even hours of this sort of progression. It results as the kind of the end stage of any, any number of insults. So it could be pneumonia, aspiration, uh, a transfusion reaction, sepsis, a transplant, so a bone marrow transplant, which could cause graft versus host, or a lung transplant where the native immune system is attacking the foreign lungs, blunt trauma, or influenza or viral pneumonias. We've seen this a lot with the COVID-19 um, pandemic that's been going on as I'm recording this. So uh, we've been having a lot of people with very severe, very bad ARDS um, here this, this year in 2020 when I'm recording this. Pathophysiology, basically we have a lot of inflammation, which we, this is the interstitium, which should be relatively thin uh, to allow for diffusion that has a lot of inflammatory cells in it. The epithelium is almost completely sloughed off, so we're losing surface area. And then we have a lot of proteinaceous material that's getting secreted out into the alveolar space that's also um, creating a um, really poor diffusion. Um, this draws in fluid into the alveolar space, which basically causes a non-cardiogenic pulmonary edema, which again worsens oxygenation. In terms of, uh, in terms of how we uh, diagnose ARDS, we really don't diagnose it with a lung biopsy, so we don't really think about tissue like I showed you on the previous slide. What we use are clinical criteria. So again, I told you this happens pretty quickly, usually within days or even hours. Um, our definition, which is the Berlin definition, is um, is timing less than or equal to a week before the um, after the clinical insult. So if you have one week insult, then worsening symptoms, that meets our timing criteria. Also, in terms of imaging, remember that chest x-ray, we need bilateral opacities, but it can't be effusions. It can't be atelectasis, like where you have uh, um, part of your lung that's completely collapsed. It can't be a big mass or nodules like that or something like that. Um, and then the origin, you need you need to exclude somehow cardiac failure or volume overload. So you, maybe an echocardiogram or something like that. You need some sort of ev level of objective data that suggests that it's not explained uh, by a cardiac etiology. In terms of severity, we use this thing called the P to F ratio, where we take the uh, partial pressure of oxygen in the arter artery, and we divide it by the fraction of inspired O2. And before we talk about severity, let's figure out what your P to F ratio is with this, uh, with this quick question. So let's assume that your arterial oxygen is 100 millimeters of mercury and that you are breathing room air, which is 21% O2. This is 0.21 FiO2. If that's the case, what is your P to F ratio? Is it 476, 4.8, 0 0.21, or is it 210? Hopefully you have all selected 476, which is 100 divided by 0.21. So again, the fraction we actually use of inspired auction, we actually use it as the actual fraction, so divided by 0.21. There are some limitations to this. Um, of course, 21% um, oxygen is very different at uh, sea level as it is at Denver, so there are some limitations of this definition, but the advantage of it is that this is a very easy to calculate uh, definition, so um, for the most part, um, it works just fine. So that being said, now that we know that maybe a normal is somewhere in the neighborhood of 450 to 500. Here's what our definitions are. So mild ARDS is a PDF ratio of 201 to 300. Moderate is 101 to 200 and severe is less than 100. So notice as the number gets lower, the severity goes up and we've got basically categories of 200 to 300, 100 to 200 and less than 100. So these are our definition. This is how we describe the severity of, um, of ARDS. 
The physiologic consequences is that, one, we have impaired diffusion. This is because, of course, there's fluid in the alveoli, there's proteinaceous material, those hyaline membranes in the, um, in the alveoli. The interstitium is full of inflammatory cells, so it's really thick. In some areas, we actually have completely consolidated, completely filled up alveoli, and any blood flow that goes through there essentially has um, shunt physiology, so we have really bad um, VQ or ventilation perfusion mismatching. We have poor compliance because when, um, when our alveoli are full of surfactant and air, it's they're very compliant. They can open and close with relatively low levels of pressure. But when we start filling it with all this gunk, um, it starts to take a lot of pressure to open and um, to open up the lungs. This causes, of course, increased dead space, which will raise the um, which will raise the carbon dioxide. And finally, some of the cardiovascular complications includes this thing called core pulmonary. So all of this stuff will cause vasoconstriction of the pulmonary arterioles. That'll put pressure on the right side of the heart. That causes pulmonary hypertension. Again, we call this core pulmonary. All right, let's talk about management. Most of management is supportive is supportive care, and when I show you the next CT scan, I think you're going to understand intuitively how we manage stuff. So when I showed you the chest x-ray, it looked like there was bilateral infiltrates and it was homogeneous. Well, that's not really the case. Usually the anterior segments of the lung are relatively normal, followed by and densely consolidated bases of the lung. So we have dense consolidation here. We have something that's a little bit in between. You might hear people call this ground glass, and you have these relatively normal areas of lung up here. So notice the normal areas of lung are small. These are baby lungs and you got to treat them like baby lungs. This area is, um, this area might be recruitable if we could find enough end expiratory pressure. So we might be able to open up some of these lungs to get them to look like this. And this part of the lung, until the process is over, is probably not going to open up at all. So it doesn't matter how much PEEP, how much expiratory pressure you put on, this probably isn't going to open. So maybe we need to come up with ways of diverting blood flow from here to the better part of the lung. All right, so this now we're going to get into the management, and it should make sense. So the first management, the most important thing that I want you to remember low tidal volumes, okay? We're gonna target six millimeters per kilogram of ideal body weight. So if you have a morbidly obese patient, you are not going to use their actual body weight. You want to use their ideal body weight. There are calculators online for use for figuring this out. So I would encourage you to look at those calculators for finding their ideal body weight. Six millimeter milliliters, excuse me, per kg. You wanna make this is to avoid volutrauma. Now as I said before, these people patients have really poor compliance, so they tend to get really high pressures really easily. You want to keep their plateau pressure, which is their pressure on an inspiratory hold, less than 30 centimeters of water. Okay, Plateau less than 30 centimeters of water, or their driving pressure, which is a plateau pressure minus their PEEP, less than 15 centimeters of water. Okay, So this is to avoid volutrauma. This is to avoid barotrauma. Okay, so this is the most important aspect of ARDS is to treat those baby lungs with small volumes and um, trying to keep their pressures low. And if their carbon dioxide is a little bit high and their pH is a little bit low, that's okay. We call this permissive hypercapnia. Next is to increase the PEEP. It is to try to get those in-between areas of the lung to open up and to oxygenate better. Um, we don't know the actual right set of PEEP for any particular person. It is a very patient-to-patient -patient de dependent thing. So a thin person was probably going to need less PEEP than a morbidly obese person will. A morbidly obese person, they have weight that might cause collapse of their alveoli, and so you might need more pressure, more PEEP to uh, recruit some of their areas of lung. But here's a little table that's taken from ARDSnet that at least lets you look at how much FIR2 your patient is, and how much PEEP you should be considering. They have a low PEEP strategy and a high PEEP strategy in this table, so I would encourage you to use this as a starting point. And again, this is very patient-to-patient -patient, um, dependent, so this is not necessarily going to be true for every given patient, but it's at least a good starting point for you. 
Other therapies. We may give someone neuromuscular blockade, so completely paralyze the patient to get them more compliant with the ventilator so they're not having dyssynchrony with the ventilator. Any type of dyssynchrony, like if you're taking a double breath, could cause more volutrauma, more barotrauma. So sometimes in severe cases, we'll do neuromuscular blockade. We may try the prone position in the patient. So again, if you think about your patient with relatively normal lungs in the anterior parts, um, if we put them in the prone position, we can encourage blood flow to go to those normal parts of the lung, which will help with that oxygenation. In refractory in refractory cases, we may try this thing called ECMO, which is extracorporeal um, membranous oxygenation. This is where we take large volumes of blood out of the body, run it through an oxygenator, and send it back to the patient. There are a lot of complications that can happen with this, so we tend to reserve this when we've exhausted all of our other options. And then finally, for medication, uh, we will often use glucocorticoids, though this is somewhat controversial. Um, it's usually reserved for early ARDS, less than two weeks, and we typically reserve it for uh, moderate to severe ARDS. The most recent study um, came out in The Lancet just this year in 2020, uh, where they suggested there might be a benefit of a two-week regimen of dexamethasone. Again, this is somewhat controversial, so to... Um, give you an idea of why it's controversial in, say, COVID-19, um, a lot of people think that glucocorticoids could potentially help with the inflammation, but it could also hinder the body's ability to um, to take care of the virus itself. So we worry that um, in cases like influenza or COVID-19, that if we impair the immune system, that we could have runaway um, replication of virus. At the same time, um, ARDS is usually because of an inflammatory response. So that's why it's a little bit controversial. Um, talk to your attendings uh, about this. Again, there's the most recent study is from The Lancet in just this year, 2020. So that does it for respiratory failure three, acute respiratory distress syndrome. If you are doing your ICU rotation um, in 2020 right now, you are undoubtedly going to be seeing this a lot, and it's very important for, to get comfortable with managing this particular um, this particular syndrome. Good luck on your IC rotation. Again, this is Zach Fulkerson.